Hi guys. Well, it is another blah winter day here with the sun going down at a quarter to four in the afternoon here on this gloomy, yes, the log. It is a Saturday. We are at Saturday. Are we in December 3rd or December 4th? Somewhere in there. Good Lord, trudging through December. So anyway, uh, the last month of 2022, good Lord, get us through. But uh, I think I might have promised you yesterday that I was going to be going back to medium.com for more doom and gloom into the bottomless pit of uh, medium.com. But there's been a change of plans because my uh, good friend Elliot Jacobson, who you may recognize Elliot's name. Elliot Jacobson has, I wish he had written it himself, but uh, next best thing, at least Elliot has spotted what in many ways is the single most spot on intelligent analysis of what is going on on this planet that I have ever read in my entire life. If, if you, it's like this dude is reading my mind, okay? This is, if you had to sum up Collapse Chronicles and what I've been trying to say at least since this uh, bright green lies of the green energy revolution has come along to stain our planet, it would be this. And uh, Book Hermit, I think even Book Hermit should approve of this story. And uh, this is coming out of this outfit called The Intercept. And I have a little bit, because it's telling me to become a member of The Intercept, and I'm thinking, oh my God, is there another medium.com? But this fellow writing for The Intercept never heard of this man. He's a journalist named Christopher Ketchum. K-E-T-C-H-A-M. Never heard of Christopher, and I find that he is a resident of upstate New York. <coughs> so anyway, uh, maybe uh, I'm making no promises. Maybe Christopher lives on this very street, but Christopher has done his homework and spelled out what is going on on this planet? You take it away, Christopher Ketchum. It should article should win the Pulitzer Prize, although it will never make it into the mainstream media. <clears throat> Addressing climate change will not save the planet. The dismal reality is that green energy will save not the complex web of life on Earth, but the particular way of life of one domineering species. All right. <clears throat> Conservation biology finds itself in a terrifying place today. Witness to mass extinction, helpless to stop the march of industrial Homo sapiens, the pillage of habitat, the loss of wildlands, and the impoverishment of ecosystems. Many of its leading figures are in despair. Quote, I am 40 years into conservation biology, and I can tell you we are losing badly, getting our asses kicked. Dan Ash, director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under President Barack Obama, told me recently, quote, there are almost no reasons to be optimistic, close quote. <clears throat> this might explain the disciplines, you know, conservation biology disciplines, desperate hitching of its wagon to the climate movement. Climate, after all, is the environmental cause du jour eclipsing 
all other sustainability concerns increasingly attractive as a rallying cry for a public that has canonized it as one of the major political, social, and economic issues of our time. Mainstream climate activism of the Bill McKibben variety points toward a grandly hopeful end within the confines of acceptable capitalist discourse. Decarbonization of the global economy with technologies driven by profit-seeking corporations subsidized by governments. Taking up this banner of optimistic can-do-ism, the environmental movement has convinced itself and sought to convince the public that with a worldwide build-out of renewable energy systems, humanity will power its dynamic industrial civilization with jobs producing green machines, while also somehow rescuing countless species from the break," <clears throat> said Dan Ash. But this happens to be a lie. The lie is that if we address the climate crisis, we will also solve the biodiversity crisis, close quote. And there you go. Uh, it is the probably the biggest overarching green lie behind all of the other bright green lies. One more time. Anyone who does not understand what the lie that's being rammed down your throat by these clueless moron, usually lefty, mainstream environmentalist is that if we address the climate crisis, we will also solve the biodiversity crisis. Close quote. Thank you for spelling out, well, one of the, uh, certainly one of the big lies of the 21st century. A group of conservationists took up the question of climate and extinctions last year in the journal Conversation Letters, warning that, quote, threats to biodiversity are increasingly seen through the myopic lens of climate change, close quote. The authors who titled their article, An Inconvenient Misconception, Climate Change is not the principal driver of biodiversity loss, included Joel Berger, a wildlife biologist at Colorado State University, evolutionary biologist Andrew Dobson, who teaches at Princeton, and Tim Cairo, an evolutionary ecologist at the University of California at Davis, and he links uh, his article to their article, which I might be reading in the next few days, uh, quoting uh, the article co-authored by these three conservation biologists, quote, there is an assumption that climate change is now the most important horseman of the biodiversity apocalypse, despite this being at best premature. Yes, the, it is the dark horse of, uh, it, it is the dark horse of the biodiversity apocalypse. <clears throat> that was me, by the way. <clears throat> when it comes to effects on wildlife, climate change is more like a mule, slow in plotting. Yes, a warmed atmosphere is projected to be a significant factor 
in the extra in the extinction crisis in future decades but what is destroying species today is habitat fragmentation and loss over hunting and over exploitation agricultural expansion pollution and industrial development it is not climate change that caused a 69 percent loss in total wildlife populations between 1970 and 2018 according to the world wildlife fund study published this year the cause the cause is too many people demanding too much from ecosystems or you know otherwise known as human overshoot of the biophysical carrying capacity of the earth and i'm just going to break it here once again when i say if climate change was nowhere in the picture it would make no difference to what is going on on this planet today in the near future with each passing year it will become a bigger player in the extinction crisis but as uh, this man just explained climate change had exactly zero to do zero to do with the 69% uh, collapse in total wildlife populations over the last uh, 50 years. Nothing to do with it. <clears throat> okay, but back to the real cause, which is not climate change. The cause, you know, of all of our fellow earthlings going extinct is, one more time, too many people demanding too much from ecosystems or human overshoot of the biophysical bio carrying capacity of the earth. Overshoot is a product of both, both excessive numbers, meaning excessive numbers of humans and rising affluence. It is not one or the other. It is a two-headed snake, and of course, it, it's actually a three-headed snake when you add technology into it. But anyway, all right. Overshoot is a product of both excessive numbers and rising affluence access to the things that create what we call quality of life, like indoor lighting and temperature controls, especially air conditioning. More diverse dietary choices, especially meat, and greater access to transportation, especially air travel, all signs of rising affluence, all delightful if you are a human, yet all demand more energy and material inputs that involve scouring and denuding more wildlands and habitat to feed, clothe, house, and energize burgeoning hue Manatee. Hmm. According to the co-authors of the conservation letters piece, we are, quote, dangerously ignoring this reality and instead doubling down on the, quote, distortion, the distortion that climate mitigation is all that matters to protecting wildlife. Over the last 30 years, the proportion of scientific papers closely tying climate change and global warming to change in patterns of biodiversity has steadily increased according to their analysis. 
media coverage of climate change in relation to biodiversity has followed suit, repeating and compounding the error. Hmm. The net result of this, quote, misguided focus on climate change, close quote, has been the undermining conservation science, has been the undermining of conservation science, quote, as an evidence-based scientific discipline, close quote. As Dobson put it to me, quote, if conservation biologists don't take a balanced look at the evidence, they cannot claim to be evidence-based, close quote. The crux of the problem, what is the crux of the problem, is that mainstream environmentalist, I need to break in here, I am not, never have been, and with each passing day, never will be an environmentalist. Sam Mitchell of Collapse Chronicles is not an environmentalist. This is not an environmental YouTube channel, okay? If anybody here is thinking that this is a mainstream environmental uh, YouTube site, you are in the wrong place. This is for people like this man who are able to handle the truth that mainstream environmentalism is, is getting to be a, a, a big a pack of lies as good Lord, take your pick. Anyway, I just had to make that uh, disclaimer right here. Back to uh, Christopher. <clears throat> The crux of the problem is that mainstream environmentalists have siloed climate change as a phenomenon apart from the broad human ecological footprint, separate from deforestation, overgrazing of livestock, megafauna kill-off, collapsing fisheries, desertification, depleted freshwater, soil degradation, oceanic garbage gyres, toxification of rainfall with microplastics, and on and on. The myriad biospheric effects of breakneck growth. This is, all right, I knew it was going to happen. We are going to hear from ecologist William Rees, professor emeritus at the University of British Columbia. And uh, you can find my interview with uh, William Rees. Uh, I consider that interview to be certainly in the top five and uh, it might be the number one most intelligent conversation I have ever had w with another human being on this planet. Uh, you can find it. Uh, just put in William Reese. It'll come up. Anyway, take it away, William Reese, and explain uh, this to us. That climate change is, quote, but one symptom of an environmentally dysfunctional system of constant growth of, econo of economies and populations. The meta problem that we need to keep our eyes on, Reese said, is ecological overshoot. Modern techno-industrial culture, he writes, quote, is systematically, even enthusiastically, consuming the biophysical basis of its own existence, close quote. Reese describes this as a malignant process, humanity as cancer, 
That is exactly what this is. It is a malignant process and humanity is the cancer. And uh, so if you go on this link uh, here and then it links you over to this article by William Reese, which I might be reading in the near future as well. <clears throat> Reese is hardly alone in his stark assessments of the status quo. In the most recent letter of World Scientist Warning, a semi-annual notice to the public, 12 experts in life sciences, global system dynamics, and ecology noted that, quote, most planetary boundaries that regulate the state of the Earth are beyond their safe space, therefore climate change is not a standalone issue. It is part of a larger systemic problem of ecological overshoot." Close quote. The authors added the common sense observation that humanity, quote, cannot sustain unlimited growth on a finite world, close quote, a physical law of life on earth that we ignore at our peril. <clears throat> it may be that solving the climate crisis because we will solve it with bold technologies to maintain ourselves in overshoot, as opposed to practicing humility and restraint with an eye toward contraction of the human enterprise will accelerate extinctions. To shorten that sentence, it may be that solving the climate crisis will accelerate extinctions due to the demands for space and minerals to drive the technologies. Uh, so I just did a, uh, a video, I think in the last week, uh, about this very subject, which, uh, which consumes uh, most of the rest of this article, and it fleshes out so if you heard my video from a few days ago talking about this, uh, bear with me. This is just more evidence of the bright green lies. Uh, and then he spends quite a bit of time on this subject, and then we'll tie it all together at the end. <clears throat> okay. As we've heard before here, to generate solar and wind power on the scale necessary to decarbonize the U.S. utility and transportation sectors, for example, requires land use on a massive scale. Solar and wind occupy much larger acreage than oil and gas, requiring networks of roads and utility corridors, transportation and transmission capacity that does not exist today. Environmental lawyer Michael Gerard, founder and director of the Sabine Center for the Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School, estimates that the U.S. needs a tripling or even quadrupling of transmission capacity up from the 160,000 miles of high voltage power lines now in operation. So multiply 160,000 times three to four to get an idea of how many miles of new power lines we're going to need to put across this country to save the planet. <clears throat> yes, to move all the new green energy to consumers who are mostly in cities from the remote places where it is harvested. A report from the Brookings Institution states that wind and solar require 10 
times more land per unit of power produced than coal or natural gas fired power plants. I think I was mentioning this a few days ago. A figure that takes into account the land torn up and habitat destroyed in order to drill out, pump, and transport fossil fuels. The report states, matter of factly, quote, renewable power production will take place in areas that have not seen energy development, close quote. And this is, you know, well, once again, at the risk of repeating myself, where this is going to be happening a lot is on our public lands. That our public lands are getting ready to be more devastated and destroyed by the green energy revolution than fossil fuels have ever affected our public lands. For Joe Biden to quote, act like he's going to stop drilling on our public lands, and, 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 and you know what I'm saying, our public lands ain't seen nothing yet compared to what's getting ready to come down the pike uh, in the name of saving the planet by all of these clueless moron mainstream environmentalists. You can find plenty of YouTube channels to listen to them. This is not one of them. Back to Christopher. <clears throat> I think we've heard this too. There is also the global scale of mining needed to extract and process the lithium, nickel, cobalt, rare earths, and other necessities for renewable infrastructure. The net result, the net result, decarbonizing will likely lead to huge fragmentation of land in the U.S. and overseas particularly in minerals rich China and the global south, and not just wildlife will be affected. The death villages around the Bayan Obo mine in China, source of 70% of the world's rare earths, are testament to the health cost of green tech mining, which is only going to accelerate in pace and scale. Consider the green destruction, <laughs> I love that. Consider the green destruction of habitat now unfolding in the Mojave Desert across California and Nevada, where the rush to build industrial solar is catastrophic for native flora, flora and fauna, said Patrick Donnelly, who works at the Center for Biological Diversity, investigating the environmental effects of the renewable energy rush in the American West. Quote, utility scale solar is just as bad as urbanization and development. The result is that the Mojave is in big trouble, close quote. Start with site-specific Mojave plant species such as the tricorner milk vetch and the white-margined beard tongue, lovely rare flowers endemic only to certain valleys and basins. They are goners under the solar regime. From there, the picture only gets uglier, with the likely wiping out of huge stretches of habitat for the broad suite of Mojave fauna. Foxes, hawks, badgers, rabbits, and most prominently the desert tortoise, the keystone species of the Mojave, whose construction of extensive burrows provides homes for at least a dozen other species. Quote, if there were no desert tortoises to dig new burrows, states of Fish and Wildlife Service manual about the species, it would lead to, quote, the demise of the ecosystem. Said Donnelly, this conservation biologist Donnelly, quote, 
the worst thing these massive solar projects do is cause direct habitat loss for the tortoise and friends, close quote, Donnelly Tulby. The grim future that rampant solar development promises for Mojave wildlife is already in evidence where migratory passages for tortoises have been compromised by existing solar. Climate change modeling tells us the optimal temperature range for the tortoise is moving steadily northward. And so the tortoise will seek that path north to survive. Critical passages for this expected migration have already been cut off. Ivampa Valley, a bottleneck between the East Mojave and the North Mojave, is now severed by solar. Parump Valley, another passage to the north, is slated for solar that will have a similar blockading effect. There are tens of thousands of acres in the Mojave Desert containing what the U.S. Bureau of Land, Land Management calls, quote, high density populations of desert tortoises that are now being developed for solar with the expected result, according to Donnelly and other watchdogs, that tortoises will wink out, otherwise mean get obliterated off the face of the planet. Some 60,000 acres of BLM land, can you say our public land? Some 60,000 acres of our public land adjacent to near pristine Death Valley National Park have been proposed for industrial solar. One of those sites is Sark. Copetus Flat, a wild place, mostly empty of human habitation, which is a value in itself, as wildlife needs big open spaces free of the meddling of Homo sapiens. Situated in the Great Basin Mojave transition zone, Sargopetus is a vast valley of Joshua trees, greasewood, and blackbrush. The Joshua tree, which the Fish and Wildlife Service is considering for protection under the Endangered Species Act, is already on a path to extinction. Joshua tree woodlands being one of the most imperiled ecosystems in the American West. The solar project at Sargopetus Flat would kill, bulldoze, and stack in cordwood piles between 50,000 and 70,000 Joshua trees. According to a field estimate by the nonprofit Basin and Range Watch, this is a great way to protect uh, Joshua trees from extinction. Okay, the Great Basin Desert to the north, meanwhile, remains you know, today, mostly free of the techno-industrial regime. But that is ending with the advent of new electrical transmission pro projects into these remotest parts of Nevada. A project called GreenLink that electricity and natural gas provider Nevada Energy is funding. GreenLink North, pending approval, is planned to run along Highway 50, the infamous loneliest road in America, from Reno to Eli, through some of the wildest parcels of public land in the state and prime habitat for the endangered greater sage-grouse. The ground-nesting bird, like the desert tortoise, is an indicator species of landscape health. The purpose of the transmission line, as Nevada Energy has made clear, is to render solar economically feasible in those remote, sun-rich landscapes. 
GreenLink North, along with the associated solar fields it will make possible, is expected to devastate some of the last strongholds of sage grouse in north central Nevada as the birds are exquisitely sensitive to the light and noise of development. It may be, it may be that global society can achieve a measure of sustainability in climate terms, but on a planet that has been stripped of creatures like the tortoise and the sage grouse, shorn of natural agency, reduced to a biological pauper, its last wildernesses occupied for the greater good of the industrial juggernaut. We will be a kind of gleaming metallic Noah's Ark that carries few animals, only lots of people. Pondering these matters, Dan Ash had arrived at a revelation that amounted to a conservation biologist's worst nightmare. Quote, I've come around to the idea that a lot of the diversity of life on Earth may be incompatible with human ambitions and aspirations. Huh. On the other hand, I can be very optimistic about climate because ultimately humanity is going to deal with carbon pollution. It's an issue for our well-being. We can solve it by building machines and making money. That's obvious in the Inflation Reductions Act. Now, guys, I am not saying uh, I am agreeing with anything in that part of the quote. Okay, but now, <clears throat> getting back to reality. But with the biodiversity crisis, you cannot solve it with machines, and it involves constraints on our making money, and history shows we are not very good at constraint. Ash suggests that conservation biologists cease, cease, and desist and end and shut STFU. Anyway, I think you get the point. Ash suggests that conservation biologists cease the empty claims about saving the planet with climate mitigation and start speaking truth. There is at present no plan in any country, anywhere, on a global or national scale to address extinctions, biodiversity crash, and habitat loss. The dismal reality as that is that with a green build out, we will be saving not the complex web of life on Earth, but the particular way of life of one privileged domineering species that depends for its success on a nature ravaging network of technological marvels. Only once this truth is understood can honest decisions be made about what kind of world humanity wishes to inhabit in the age of ecological disorder. Hallelujah. Amen. Christopher Ketchum. And uh, again, I might have to track down Brother Christopher and I see uh, if maybe we can meet up and have us a little talk. Upstate New York can mean a lot of things in, in December. Anyway, 
get out there and enjoy your desert tortoises, your sage grouse, and your public lands while you still can because they are getting ready to be attacked. Thank you, uh, Christopher Ketchum, for exposing the biggest uh, bright green lie of the whole pack of them. Bye, guys. Yeah, little dog. You ready for your dinner?